This podcast shines light on strong and talented women who excel and persevere in life while bathing in abundant self-love. So if you're ready to keep it real, level up in all your inner work, creative business, and community impact, then you've come to the right place because we provide you with content that helps your soul glow and your mind grow. Thank you for pressing play. Let's dive in. Hey community, Stuck Founder Brett here. It is so good to talk to you again on another episode. And this episode is all about our Fly Girl Initiative. And what is the Fly Girl Initiative, you ask? Um, Fly stands for First Love Yourself. And it is an initiative that I first came up with when traveling uh, to Ghana. And actually below uh, this episode, I will link a vlog uh, that I recorded and edited and filmed from my solo trip to Ghana, um, where we first established this program as well as our Little Hardest program. And so the Fly Girl Initiative is our grant program. It allows us to give educational funds to individual girls in underserved communities so that they can have their basic needs met in order to create in more ease, flow, and joy. And really like through this program, we want to inspire strong women to inspire strong girls. Um, but really, you know, also if you're a man and you happen to be interested in giving back to uh, girls uh, who really do need help, so much help right now, then, you know, that works too. All right. So what are the goals of the Fly Girl Initiative? Uh, so number one, to bring awareness to the global education crisis of girls and the importance of self-love art education. Number two, to give girls of color access to the art world so that they may live a creative life that they absolutely love. Number three, to provide funds, supplies, and drawing classes digitally and physically to girls in underserved communities. So, you know, with this program, we really encourage our girls to stay fly. And how do we do that? We make sure like that they have updated uniforms. Um, Something that I really noticed when traveling in Ghana was that it was like really hard for girls to keep up with like the way that they were growing and then like to get new uniforms each time. And a lot of times their family didn't have the money to do that. And then like they can't go to school with no uniform. So then it's kind of like they just have to stay home from school. And that's it's just it's a really harsh reality for girls in Ghana to stay home from school. It's like they really don't have anything to do. Uh, and to clarify, Diamond State Academy is like in a rural part of Ghana. So it's like when these girls are not able to go to school, I mean, they just have kind of like dirt to uh, play games in and sit around in and like just th there's no, they don't have books or um, any other like resources at all. So you know, going to school is a big deal. Going to school is their way out of like, you know, basically being trapped in that environment and never really like elevating or evolving out of that. And so uh, when I was in Ghana, I met this little girl named Adwa and she like, <laughs> she, uh, ha I don't remember like, I just remember she like clung to me the when I when I arrived at Diamond State Academy it was like a ma weird magnetism and she just would not like leave my side the entire time and so um because of that I got to know her really well and then um teacher Medina who is our fly girl ambassador in Ghana she um really was like you know, interested in telling me more about um, her and her family. And so she took me to their home uh, to see, you know, what the conditions were like. And really, it's just like they were living in a kind of like a shack, but it not it wasn't even a shack because it was like this house um, that was kind of it, it was like a concrete foundation of a building kind of. And it and I think they were supposed to like build on that property, build those um, living spaces out, but the government never like, you know, 
finished or went forward with it. So it was like that. Yeah, they were living in these kind of this kind of like abandoned um, these abandoned half houses. Uh, and if I can find an image, I'll definitely insert it, um, you know, for this YouTube video. But it just really blew me away because they also didn't really have any means at all. Like their their mom, she would sometimes sell food on the streets, but it's really common in Ghana to just for people not to have money, just to like walk around with no money. And, you know, and something beautiful about that also is that, you know, while that is a reality, I don't think I've ever met happier people than I met when in Ghana. Like, I really think that my hope, my capacity for like, believing in human kindness in that pure God based source based, just just pure kindness, you know, universal kindness. You know, I, I almost like my light almost went out for that. I think around like, what was it 2018 or so and you know and then traveling to Ghana like whew, it just like really reignited it because I was like oh my god like there are people like me like there are people who just love to love life and love to love and love to be in joy whether they have money or they don't or whether they have the funds or not or whether you know it's about the money or not or whether it's about the success or not or whether it's high or low or not you know they're still gonna like be in joy somehow and dance and smile and communicate and have conversation and 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 give and share and pour into one another and so um yeah that that trip up to Ghana for me it really nourished me and it really fed me and it also really led me to see like you know the the disparity the the, the some similarities between the capitalism um that the british you know enforced in uh, Ghana and then also in America some commonalities there but um you know it was just like so such an it was a, a, a wake I think it was another awakening for me honestly that I think that's what it was I, and I think I just figured that out right now um but yeah and so when I was there you know um and I noticed that Ottawa she didn't have a um she didn't have a like a backpack she didn't have her, her shoe any shoes really to wear she was wearing sandals and they weren't even allowed to really let her in the school with sandals because it's not their dress code and uh she had grown out of her uniform so um I didn't have a lot of time but I just I knew it had to be done like she, that her situation needed to be changed just because I don't know I just loved her and so um I and she had a sister as well who was always like hanging by me. And so uh, on, you know, the trip, I, I brought like, you know, coloring books, um, our custom coloring books, crayons, supplies uh, for all the girls. And, you know, most girls had never had a pencil or anything like that. So they were all blown away. But, you know, I just I realized that, wow, like um, it's really important that like, I mean, how are they going to? create these things and color in the coloring books and, you know, use the crayons or whatever, if they're not even making it to school. And if, and if they can't like, you know, afford their basic needs, um, you know, and a lot of times they go hungry until they can come to school because it's amazing. Um, Ambassador Medina, her father is the uh, founder of the school and he has this custom kitchen that is just it's phenomenal and it and they have their own chefs and their own cooks and um so they cook custom meals for the kids uh for lunch or for breakfast and, and lunch and you know it's their main meal of the day uh, they really don't eat other than that so um yeah it's it's really important you know for them to make it to school and we really do think that it has the ability to mature girls who lack financial confidence into limitless women who really can do what they love for a living um, and do what they creatively love for a living. But, you know, first we have to keep them in school. First, we have to, you know, make sure their basic needs are being met. And 
Um, and that's not an easy feat, but we're centered and focused on our, we're not speaking about like all of Ghana. We're speaking of about our partner school, you know, and our partner school, I think in total, maybe there's like about 500 students or so, like in the specific uh, class that Medina taught, like each class is around 30 kids, 25 to 30 kids. Um, so, you know, it's a fair amount of kids, uh, but it's not all of Ghana. It's not, you know, such a like vast scope that we can't really tackle as a community, I don't think. Um, and I think it's so important that, especially like in rural areas that really aren't getting government attention, that we like realize that there are still girls there. There are girls that are that are going to become our future and like what what is going to happen if we're just ignoring them and letting them drown in like in poverty in just neglect in and in a lack of education of like of self-love which you know we are very passionate about weaving into um our arts education principles and teachings and philosophies so you know, uh, this program is super important to me. I value it so much. Um, and I hope that this episode can really like, I don't know, shine light on any any holes that, you know, we're maybe missing in, in people's understanding of, of what it really is, of how deep and how important it really is. Because, you know, um, it's just like, Ghana is for me, you know, it's ancestry. It's where I come from. And it's like um, my motherland. And if it, one of them, you know, because I'm Ghanaian and also Nigerian. But like, you know, for, for me, that's it's just like touching on the root, the root, you know, the root of the problem and like the root of the problem of there not being more black women in the art world dominating and conquering things is really because, you know, of the lack of art education given to girls, given to Black and Indian and Brown and Latinx girls and, you know, and, and Asian girls sometimes. And, you know, we just are, I think we have such creative prowess. I think that we are so magnetic and so inspiring and so influential. And I think that these capitalistic systems, these British systems, these old, archaic, dying systems, you know, make us forget that, make us forget like how powerful Black girls and women are, how powerful Indian girls and women are. And, you know, um, Tazine is in Mumbai, India, and India has always been a passion of mine. Um, and uh, she lives there. So it's obviously a passion for her. And that's her ancestry. So, you know, our goal is to also find a partner school in India as well. And, you know, it's just been really hard to translate, like, giving in general, I guess, to, to the American collective, because it's like, so many people are in this kind of, uh, capitalistic rat race this treadmill this this you know like race of more 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 money more more power more individual success more fame 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 for myself self self and I just think that it's so important to give back and like with my own art, with my um, art shows, with my art sales, like I always wanted a way to um, give back my art sales, you know, to a greater cause. Um, I have a personal art collection, which is you can find at brettsins.com. But and and with that, like, and with um, the stuck collection, I have a solo show coming up. And it's going to be all about protecting black women and black girl magic. And I'm going to include a lot of the images I took of the girls from Diamond State Academy uh, within the show. And I'm really excited about that because I've never shown any of my photography before. So I think that's going to be really exciting. Um, 
but yeah, we're all really, really passionate about this program. And we intend for the proceeds of the art show to um, go funnel back, you know, into the program into helping us expand it more, um, hopefully getting back to Ghana soon. And, you know, and just really like, helping girls thrive the way they need to thrive and survive the way that they need to survive. Because like even me not coming from, you know, not coming from a family of poverty, I've still faced like crazy adversity, things that no one should ever have to go through. And the things that I talk about, you know, on this podcast, trust me, they're far worse, like, than I, you know, than I explain than the things that I kind of like bring up. But it's just like, we as black girls, black women, Indian girls, Indian women, um, go through a lot of family trauma and, and drama and struggle to, and, and, you know, and that is a lot of the reason I think, um, you know, that creates a lot of blocks in, you know, in us evolving as artists, evolving as creatives. And then you add the whole, a whole nother layer of the system, which is just, not for black women it's just literally not built for black women um and you know and in india and in ghana as well nigeria as well like you know those were british colonized systems as well so you know systems not for black women and it's just like i think that black girls and women deserve so much more black girls matter you know and who it's just it's a powerful 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 program and it has the ability to move shift move shift shape and create new and innovative change in society um and i think it just takes conscious minds to really understand it and to really grasp it because you know i think that the future is very very female and we lead by example. And I think that just seeing Black girls rise up from Ghana is very powerful. I think that that's part of the reason why our, you know, Instagram was shut down because, you know, it's, they don't want to see us in power. They don't want to see Black girls and Black women in power. And trust me, the girls at Diamond State Academy are powerful. It's just the creativity is out of this world and they deserve so much more. Um, so yeah, that's what this program is about. And I'd love for you guys to um, hear more from the team, our team about this program um, and a bit like, yeah, what they have to say about it because yeah, multiple perspectives are great. Um, so let's hear from them and yeah. We essentially created the Fly Girls Initiative so that we could give girls access to the creative and artistic lifestyle that they love. You would honestly be surprised how difficult it is for young girls to get their hands on art supplies, backpacks, pencils, things that we honestly take for granted every single day in the United States. I am Madine Duchimwa Asari. I am 24 years old and I am a teacher and a student as well. Okay. Some of the challenges I've seen in this community are um, girls going to the market to sell before and after school. Also school fees. Some of the girls, their parents find it very difficult to pay their school fees. Do you know some of our young girls use rags as sanitary pads? And you know that's very bad. So we are campaigning for sanitary pads for our young girls at school between the ages of 10 to 15 years. Yes, we are trying our best to give them sanitary pads so that they can use it every month. Yeah, so please support Stack Designs and let's make this campaign a good one. Thank you. Bye. Students with access to art education are five times less likely to drop out of school. Now, like we spoke about earlier, art is therapeutic. And there are numerous reasons why a child drops out of school. Maybe it's because of dysfunctional family or, you know, troubles with friends or mental health uh, issues or anything else. Art becomes a way for them to heal and to cope. 
And moreover, if there's a child that is not able to cope with other studies or don't find it, you know, to their liking, other regular vital subjects, then art at least becomes a way for them to connect and stay in school. 72% of business leaders say that creativity is the number one skill that they seek while hiring. Now, it makes sense, doesn't it? Creativity and problem solving are such important skills that are needed, especially in today's world of constant and rapid change and very fierce competition. And art is known for building these very skills. Now, most often when schools face budget cuts, art is one of the first classes to be removed. Art, along with um, other forms of art, theater, dance, music. For example, in 2017, Pennsylvania's Cranton School District faced a budget shortage of $19 million. Now, because of this, 89 employees were laid off, a majority of which were from the above mentioned classes. Now, another instance, during the 1999 to 2000 school year, 87% of schools nationwide offered art classes, which dropped down to 83% during 2009 to 2010. Now, these are statistics from the U.S., which were itself very hard to find as compared to other areas of statistical studies. But when I tried to research other countries, like India, for instance, I found little to none numerical data. I did find conversations on why art needs to be brought back to the Indian education system, but basically finding data um, about art on a global level is a very difficult feat, impossible almost. I ch there are slim to none, and that is like, saying a, like oh I just there are almost no real stats there are no updated COVID statistics and that is for a reason trust me so more than 98 million adolescent girls around the world are not in school um and <laughs> that is a lot of empty desks that is a lot of empty dreams um but that's just like that's just so much potential being cut short. And, um, you know, and black girls deserve more. So one in four girls may fall into the clinical diagnosis of depression, anxiety, sleep deprivation, um, and other mental or emotional disorders before they are 18. Almost no low income schools in Ghana offer art education. And, you know, in the US, I didn't see, I have not seen that much difference. Like, of course, in the private schools, everyone's getting, you know, arts education. But of course, in the private schools in Ghana, kids are getting, you know, art education because, you know, parents fund the programming there um, and care about, you know, the arts. Um, but in low income communities, that is not so. So those are the statistics of girls. And like I stated before, you know, the real issue is, you know, like, or I guess I should say the the real way that we shift this issue and create change is by going to the root of the problem. And the root of the problem, you know, of Black women not being in art galleries, of Black women not having more opportunities is because, you know, art for black girls is a underserved black girls is a very rare thing. Um, so, and then, so I kind of want to like contrast what is like for black women uh, in the gallery world. So black women in major U S museums, this is a 2019 statistic and um, there are 1.2% Black women in major U.S. museums. Um, that was a stat for, yeah, 2019. And <laughs> I don't think it's changed that much. I don't, I mean, I know that we've been fighting alongside our um, partners, Art Girl Rising, um, and they haven't, update you know there's it's the same it's just it's 1.2 percent black women in major u.s museums which is horrible it's abhorrent and you know and i think like a lot of the reasons that i stated you know are why are why we aren't there 
Um, so racism in the art world. Um, in March 2019, researchers surveyed 18 of the most respected museums in America and found that there were, yeah, 1.2% um, Black women artists. And there were not many, like the Latinx artists, Asian artists, Indian artists, like are very slim to none as well. Um, and then meh, we couldn't really, there's, so, it's so very hard to find statistics on girls arts education within the United States like it's almost non-existent but we found this and it's a, it's a stat from um, art education stats from art ed org and it says children who receive arts education in the U.S. black children in the U.S. um 26 percent other children 74 percent and this statistic is like from the 80s so <laughs> So there's like, you know, it, it, it's not, it's just like that, the, you know, the system is not for us. It's not made for us. So obviously it's hard for us as a nonprofit organization to get grants, to be, you know, given any opportunities because those are like, those are systems and we're, we're, we're fighting for something that's, you know, against the system in a, in a way. And I think that, I think people fear that, but we're in a we're in a change of and we're in an age change now and things are shifting and moving and changing and like you know, we have to change with the times. We can't fear that. You know, if if people feared that in the past, we would never get anything done. So it is time for change. It's time for movement. It's time for revolution. If not now, when? That is what we say here. Uh so yes, so those are the very sad and minimal stats, I really wish I could do better because I really love, you know, pulling out the facts and, and handing out the truth. And I wish there was more like, you know, evidence I could find because I love evidence. All right. Thank you guys so much for tapping in and listening and learning and, um, and really just just showing interest, honestly, in giving, in expansion, in social change, in social justice, because, you know, um, it's that time. It's time for change. It's time for revolution. It's time for innovative programs. It's time for us to step up and stand out and um, and boldly, you know, create the new because the government, who, I mean, who's going to do it? Not the government. The government is not going to do it for us. No one is going to do it for us. Community does it, you know, that's why community is a threat. That's why community is so powerful. So no matter if you have the capacity to give or not, you know, we, well, actually, you know what? There are a lot of ways to give, whether it's because whether it's financial or, or whether it's just like showing love or sharing a post or liking a liking something or um, subscribing to our YouTube channel or following us, uh, following our Spotify podcast, whatever it is, you know, I think that that is support and that is giving as well, even if you don't have means to support this program. But we would love and very much um, need more monthly donors, need more funding, need more um, just resources to really fully push this program forward the way it needs to be pushed forward. Um, because, yeah, I think it's as powerful as Michelle Obama's uh, Girls Opportunity Alliance. I think so. And um and I think a lot of other people know that too. So, you know, if you feel so compelled to give, I always say that, um, you know, abundantly giving is vibrantly living. I think that the more you give, the more you receive. I think that, you know, the more that you give in this life, the more that it just flows back into your life and creates just more positive experiences, more rich experiences um, of life, of connection, of community. 
Um, so thank you guys so much for listening as always the community and until next time, love you. Hi everyone. Hope you liked that episode. We are all about preaching self-love and empowering women and girls around the world. Support us in our journey as we provide art supplies and many more resources to girls in Ghana through our two programs, the Fly Girl Initiative and Little Hardest. We are also working on hosting more Color for a Cause events as well as our No Filter school tours. Your help will enable this organization to work on bettering the lives of people around the world. For more information, visit our website www.stuckdesigns.org.